Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Matthew Silverman, the Executive Director of the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our program titled Redemption in Zionist Thought and Culture with Professor R.A. Sapoznik. Thank you to Americans for Ben Gurion University for helping bring this program to our community. Americans for Ben Gurion University has been a wonderful partner over the years with excellent scholarship and lectures. If you're looking for additional learning after this lecture, I highly recommend watching the talk by BGU professor Michal Bar Asher Siegel from a couple of years ago, where she explored what happens when a rabbi and a heretic meet in the Talmud. On a logistical note, as usual, if you have any questions during the presentation, please click on the Q&A button on your Zoom screen. Questions will be discussed at the end of the lecture. And I now welcome Art Hessel, the Haberman Institute Board Vice President, who will say a few words and introduce our speaker. Welcome, Art. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and welcome everybody to today's lecture, which is entitled Redemption in Zionist Thought and Culture and is being delivered by Professor Arya Saposnik, who we are very happy to welcome back to our community. Professor Saposnik addressed us in person in the year 2018, when he spoke on creating Israel's national and cultural identity. That presentation is still available on the Haberman Institute website. Today, Professor Saposnik, with a view of the Zin Valley and his Zim Valley and his background will be addressing us from Israel. And let me say as an aside that I looked at our website yesterday and I realized we now have 55 lecture videos online and 141 podcasts of previous uh, lectures. The podcasts are pre-pandemic. The videos are what we've done since COVID forced us to change our ways. So they're all available to you at no cost, and I suggest that in idle moments you tune in. As Matt said, I'm the vice president of the Haberman Institute, and I'm also the former treasurer and longtime board member of uh, Americans for Ben Gurion University, and I'm honored here today to be wearing both hats to introduce this, this talk. For those who are new to Haberman, we're a 40-year-old educational institution that offers high-quality, in-depth encounters with Jewish thought, history, and culture through lectures, classes, and more. We started out as an organization serving the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, but now we're on Zoom, and we serve audiences nationally and internationally, and we welcome all of you here today. The goals of Ben Gurion University and Americans for Ben, I'm sorry, the goals of Americans for Ben Gurion University are to support Ben Gurion University and to support it financially and to spread the word uh, throughout the world of uh, its wonderful qualities. Uh, ben Gurion University of the Negev is one of Israel's major universities, and you can learn more by going to americansforbgu.org and you will be amazed at what you see. We at Haberman invite you to learn more about our programs and classes by visiting our website, which is habermaninstitute.org. Our next offering is a two lecture series on the second temple period as a cultural bridge, the Apocrypha and Early Jewish Identity with Dr. Malka Simkovich, who's the uh, Director of Jewish Studies and the Catholic Jewish Studies Program at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. You can register with us online for one or both of those talks, February 7, February 14, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Also in February, Howard University Professor John Ahn will speak on exile and return, the birth and defining moments of ancient Judaism. Dr. Sarah Stein will be speaking uh, shortly after that on Jewish life in uh, wartime North Africa during the Second World War. And Dr. David Arno will be speaking on inspiration for your Passover Seder. Now to today. 
Professor Arya Saposnik is, is the Associate Professor at the Ben-Gurion Institute for the Study of Israel and Zionism at Ben-Gurion University in the Negev. He's a historian of Zionism and Jewish nationalism, interested in the construction of national cultures and identities in the modern world. He's the author of Becoming Hebrew, the Creation of a Jewish National Culture in Ottoman Palestine, and uh, the author of Zionism's Redemptions, Images of the Past and Visions of the Future in Jewish Nationalism. Professor Saposnik was born in California, but raised in Haifa, in Israel. He has a PhD in History and Jewish Studies from New York University. He's previously been on the faculties of both Arizona State and UCLA. And in addition to his work at Ben-Gurion, he is the current president of the uh, International Association for Israel Studies. And with that uh, resume in everybody's mind, I turn the microphone and the Zoom over to you and look forward to learning with you today. Thank you, Art, and thank you to the Haberman Institute for hosting me. Um, I will launch into the talk. So a few years ago, the walkway to the exit gates of Ben-Gurion International Airport was adorned with an exhibition of photographs and images from the history of Israel and Zionism, marking the 120th anniversary of the First Zionist Congress. At its culmination, the largest of the posters seems to be, or seemed to be, not only a summary of the history depicted in the images, but a proclamation of the state's most fundamental message to itself and to those passing through the halls of this main port of entry and exit. And we can see the first slide, please. Okay, so this is the slide. Uh, this is the poster that was hanging up on the exit hall uh, of Ben-Gurion Airport, and it reads as follows. I once called Zionism an infinite ideal, the poster quotes Theodore Herzl, who's depicted on it, larger than life. As it, as it will not cease to be an ideal even after we attain our land, the land of Israel. For Zionism encompasses not only the hope of a legally secured homeland for our people, but also the aspiration to reach moral and spiritual perfection. This is a striking quote from the Zionist thinker perhaps most closely identified with the idea of a Jewish state as the most central end seal, the most central uh, final goal, Zionism's most important goal. And Herzl is hardly alone in this. Another individual closely associated with Jewish statehood, David Ben-Gurion, surely the central figure in the very establishment of that state, would write a few years after he had declared its independence that, quote, the establishment of the state does not mean that the vision has been fulfilled. The ultimate end of Zionism, as he understood it, he stressed, was a messianic prophetic vision positioned at the meeting point of an ancient culture and longing for Zion on the one hand, and an enlightenment-informed humanistic cultural revolution and social transformation on the other. The miracle that has taken place in our generation, he explained, is that the vehicle has been created for the fulfillment of the redemptive vision. That miraculous vehicle, of course, was the state itself, vital, indispensable, indeed miraculous, as he puts it, but a vehicle rather than the ultimate goal itself. And we can see the next slide. And we have there uh, Ben-Gurion with the Bible, looking both uh, backward and forward as he creates this uh, redemptive vision. Zionism is or was a multifaceted and a sometimes frustratingly complicated phenomenon. Even its initial motivations are hard to pinpoint. Was it largely a response to the rise of modern anti-Semitism, a Jewish adoption of European nationalism, a continuation of age-old Jewish messianic longings and ideas, a rebellion against those very ideas, an authentic continuation of traditional Jewish life, an overarching revolution against traditional Jewish life? At times, Zionism has presented itself as one, both, or some combination of all of these, and I could go on and list further paradoxes. The questions I'd like to discuss today 
are based on a book I recently published, and we can see in the next slide uh, the cover of that book, which Art mentioned, which looks at one aspect, although I would certainly suggest a central aspect, of Zionism's complicated and often paradoxical nature. In the book, I attempt to explore the ambivalent and multivocal conversations that Zionism maintains or maintained with Jewish messianic traditions, Christian notions of redemption and salvation, both of these bound up, of course, with the Holy Land, and also with secular political messianisms. Today, I'd like to share with you a bit of what I've found and what I think some of the most important implications of, the, of these findings are. The redemptive dialogues that Zionism conducted took place in a range of ways, in, in internal polemics, in the construction of a wide range of cultural institutions and in the making of a new culture, in the efforts to reshape the physical landscape and public space of Palestine, at times in competition with others, particularly Christian and Muslim institutions, and more. Today, I'll, exp I'll explore two aspects of this redemptive current. First, we'll look at the way Zionists responded to the publication of the Balfour Declaration near the end of the First World War. And then we'll turn to the ways in which Zionism narrated its own history to itself, creating a picture of the past that would serve a vision of the future. And it's worth pointing out that Zionism, in fact, from a very early stage, begins to tell itself its own history. So let's turn to the Balfour Declaration and we can move to the next slide. Okay, uh, we can see in this slide, uh, of course, uh, Lord Balfour there, Chaim Weizmann, who together with Nahum Sokolov was the uh, key figure, uh, uh, key Zionist diplomat in obtaining uh, the Balfour Declaration. And down below, we can see Lord Rothschild and his zebra-drawn carriage, to whom the letter was addressed, by the way. Now, it took some three weeks for reports of the Balfour Declaration to make their way into the Eastern European Jewish press. And when they arrived, the reports were often rather laconic and certainly less enthusiastic than one might have expected. We know the Hebrew language Hatzfira editorialized on November 29th, 1917, right? The Balfour Declaration, I remind us, was issued on November 2nd. So November 29th, they didn't know this, but this would later become an important date in itself, uh, Hatzfira editorializes as follows. We know that the British government and its allies in coming to establish a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine do this not out of love for Israel. It is rather their own interests that stand before their eyes, end quote. But the same editorial argued that this was not necessarily a drawback. After all, and I quote again, Love and hate do not determine important political decisions. Uh, the author suggested further that Zionists, in fact, had cause to be encouraged, knowing that their interests and those of the most powerful governments were now, in some significant respects, in concert. He did, however, add one cautionary note that was repeated in many of the initial journalistic reactions to the news. We do not wish by any means that the Jewish nation should serve as a footstool, or we might say an ottoman, for the thrones of other peoples, he wrote. Wary of the imperial designs that lay behind the letter, in other words, the author cautioned that, quote, it is a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine that we want, in Palestine, not in Britain, America, or France. Other editorials struck similar notes, stressing the Zionist wartime policy of neutrality, and reminding readers that, quote, the Zionist movement includes Jews of all the countries of the world who are loyal citizens in their respective countries, end quote. Zionists, this author insisted, do not place our trust in one government or other, and certainly do not make our hopes dependent upon the victory of one group of countries or another. Almost dismissive of Balfour's declaration, a third author was more skeptical yet, Referring back to the Basel program's call for broad public recognition, the Basel program was the program adopted at the first Zionist Congress in 1897, this author argued that rather than a vague promise from one of the belligerents, the, quote, distortion of history that had left the Jews homeless ought to be corrected by all nations coming together. 
Now, these responses seem to accord well with a recent argument by Moti Golani and Yuda Reinhardt's, according to which the note from Balfour to Rothschild would likely have languished in a forgotten archive as a trivial and inconsequential letter had it not been for the efforts of Chaim Weizmann, who transformed this potentially trivial letter into the declaration that it became. But their thesis, it seems to me, is a bit overstated. And why do I say this? The very same issue of that newspaper, Atzvira, that carried the initial reactions to Balfour that I've just quoted, carried another reaction that struck a very different chord. Let me quote it at some length. Verses of prophecy are arising before our very eyes, wrote Yosef Heftman, who was an important journalist. In contradistinction to the political analytic approach of his colleagues in the same paper, Heftman argued that it was, and again I quote, not the drudgery of diplomatic give and take that is important here, not the letter of some minister or other, or the agreement of some governor. If we liberate ourselves briefly from the bondage of the present moment, from the age and its circumstances, then it is the fluttering of the wings of the majestic past that we hear. Today's chatterings are silenced, and the cacophony of daily life fades away. Then we seem to find ourselves in some empty space outside of the political world, and in that space is the voice of God, the voice of generations past and future, the sound of creation. From the past, from the distance of millennia, arise the ancient words now carried to new expanses. Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your tombs. We stand here, this is still Heftman, we stand here gazing at a vision of the end of days. The Jewish people has ceased to be what it has been up to today, a wandering desperate nation. It has become the ancient people of Israel, the nation anticipating its redemption and, and awaiting its return to its soil. And I end the quote there. Now, whether he was aware of it in late 1917 or not, Heftman's piece expressed a disposition that seems to have been somewhat more characteristics, characteristic of the Jewish yeshuv in Palestine in the wake of the Balfour Decla Declaration, and then with greater force with the conquest of the country by the British at shortly thereafter. Stricken by the general hardships and deprivations of war, it may not be terribly surprising that for some in Palestine, the ceremonial entry of British troops into the Holy City and the Holy Land was greeted in redemptive terms. Messianic expectations of various stripes uh, were not a rarity in the general turmoil of the Great War, the war that would, among other things, end all war, itself a kind of messianic expectation. Coming at the end of a century or more of religious competition over the geopolitical and sacred spoils of the Ottoman-held Holy Land, the war in Palestine and in the region aroused a particular set of apocalyptic and messianic associations. In the Jewish world, the Zionist call for a return to the land of Israel had been marked since its earliest days by a tension between a pragmatic, this-worldly notion that Jews were in need of a territorial base or refuge on the one hand, indeed one that at times explicitly rejected any connection to traditional messianic expectations, and on the other hand, the obvious and at times explicit overtones of the traditional liturgical anticipation of a messianic age in which the Jews will be returned to their land. And we can go to the next slide. On the heels of Allenby's entry into Jerusalem, and that's what we see in this photograph here. Uh, by the way, it's worth noting, Allenby purposely dismounted his horse and walked into Jerusalem by foot so as not to arouse excessive messianic associations. Uh, it didn't quite work. On the heels of his entry into Jerusalem, one longtime resident, Hemda ben Yehuda, published a book titled Jerusalem, its redemption and future, the great drama of deliverance described by eyewitnesses. And we can move to the next slide. Uh, here we see Chemda in the big photograph there, the larger photograph. And in the smaller photo, that is Chemda ben Yehuda with her more familiar husband, 
Eliezer ben Yehuda. Um, her book adopts an apocalyptic reading of the war itself, presenting it, or at least its, or at least its eastern front, as a struggle between Ottoman defilement of the land on the one hand and a Jewish revival, interwoven in surprising ways with a Christian sacrality on the other. Ben Yehuda describes Ottoman mistreatment and expulsions with persistent theological overtones. The Dominicans of Jerusalem, she writes in one passage, for example, were included in the act of expulsion from Jerusalem by the Ottomans. Their beautiful monastery, near the gate of St. Stephen's was appropriated by the Turks and used as a government building. The cloisters and courts previously devoted to the pious meditations of the White Fathers became so unclean as to resemble stables. Now, this is a little bit surprising since it had been not long before, well into the early months of the war, that the Ben Yehuda family and their journalistic enterprise, the Ben Yehuda's uh, basically... Um, led Hebrew language journalism in Palestine up until that point, up until the First World War. So the, uh, until well into the early months of the war, their journalistic enterprise had been at the forefront of Yishuv calls for what was then called Ottomanization, the taking on of Ottoman citizenship or subjecthood, and for support of the Ottomans in the war. Indeed, even in the waning years of Ottoman rule, the tone in the Ben Yehuda papers, as in much of the Hebrew language journalism in Palestine, tended to cast Christian institutions and projects as the principal rival to Zionist efforts in Palestine, with Zionism itself often presented as of a piece with a general renaissance of the Orient. Now, in the wake of the dramatic changes to Palestine wrought by the war and the British Declaration, it was the Ottomans who had become a source of defilement, while Jewish and Christian sacralities are now fused into one uh, are now fused into one in ways that I cannot recall coming across virtually anywhere uh, in the pre-war years. Indeed, as Ben Yehuda would have it, Jews and Christians in a Jerusalem afflicted by the hardships of the war shared both a common fate and, as she writes, one passionate desire as they, quote, waited for the hour of deliverance. The forces of life itself, as she describes it in her Manichaean presentation of the war, had been driven literally underground as Jews and Christians gathered together uh, to seek, quote, concealment in the darkest cellars and deepest subterranean passages. In these terrible days in Jerusalem, she writes, they fasted and prayed, their common sorrow and desolation drew them nearer to one another. Nevertheless, she writes, they maintained their confidence in the ultimate victory of the British liberators, and together these Jewish and Christian, quote, devout souls were uplifted in ardent prayer. Pious vows were pronounced. They prayed that the Lord God would deliver them by a miracle and show his hand as in former days. Now, as fate would have it, and rather conveniently for Chemda ben Yehuda, General Allenby's entry into Jerusalem coincided with the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. And this fact served her narrative of the events directly, linking them with the ancient desecration of the temple by the Seleucid Greeks, and of course, with its reconsecration by the Hasmoneans. It was in darkness and dread, she writes, that the Jews awaited the coming of their great festival of light and gladness. In a dramatic reenactment of the shift from destruction to redemption, from darkness to light that she associates with Hanukkah itself, Ben Yehuda describes the anticipation of a bitter fate at the hands of approaching, Ottom, uh, approaching Ottoman soldiers, and then the unexpected turn towards salvation. And here I'll quote her at some length. The women, she writes, weeping, prepared the oil for the sacred lights, and even the men wept saying that this would be the last time they should keep the feast in Jerusalem. They strained their ears to hear the horses' hoofs and the tread of the soldiers coming to arrest them and drive them forth. The women pressed their children to their breasts, crying, they are coming to take us, the persecutors, the assassins. Then, suddenly, other women came rushing from outside, down into the depths, crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, the English, the English have arrived. Weeping and shouting for joy, Jews and Christians trembling and stumbling over one another 
emerged and rushed forth from the caverns and holes and underground passages. With loud cries, with outstretched arms, they blessed the company of their deliverers, who advanced in a glory of light, for all Jerusalem was illuminated by the crimson light of the setting sun. With the victors entered justice and peace into the city so long ruled by terror and pain. Pious Jews uttered thanksgivings to the Lord God of hosts, who had wrought deliverance in this great historic day, in the very hour of the beginning of Hanukkah, the Feast of the Miracle of Lights. It was the time of the early flowers in Palestine, she concludes in her description, the first flowers which announce the resurrection of nature after the burning heat of summer is past. She attaches the, the, re, the rebirth of nature as well in this context. Now, it's not difficult to understand the sense of exultation and relief given the hardships endured by all Jerusalemite, by all Jerusalemites, excuse me, in the final days of the war. And Jerusalem was very hard hit during the war. But the redemptive dimension extended beyond this for Ben Yehuda, since Britain had arrived not merely as military conquerors, but had done so on the heels of and in the spirit of Balfour. The English, she writes, declared their desire for the advance of the Hebrews. Many times the message was heard from the lips of the British, the land which we conquer is for you. And we can move to the next slide. And we can see in this slide, um, in some of the iconography and imagery, right, the, the kind of connection that Chemda ben Yehuda makes between Hanukkah uh, and General Allenby's entry, right? We see um, uh, Judah Maccabee entering Jerusalem 165 BC and General Allenby entering Jerusalem in 1917. And you can see uh, written in the lower right hand corner, uh, with Allenby's entry, the Hebrew text reads, Uva Litzion Goel, the Redeemer uh, will come to Zion. And we can see a similar image in the next slide. Um, where once again, this is a, a memorial of uh, the British uh, conquest of Jerusalem. The Hebrew again reads, Zikaron Shihor Yerushalayim, the memorial for the, for the liberation of Jerusalem. Uh, with Allenby's entry and the famous Boris Schatz uh, statue of uh, Matityahu, Mattathias, uh, the, the Hasmonean leader. Um, uh, so the direct association was quite common. Now, Balfour had transformed, in other words, a this-worldly military geopolitical fact of British conquest into the makings of a much deeper redemption. And for the Jews of Jerusalem, the beginnings of a reconsecration, which Chemda then goes on to describe. Not long after the emergence from those dark underground caverns, she writes, the Jews, or at least some of them, resumed the work of Zionist construction. Teachers and professors gathered to reestablish schools and educational frameworks, flagships of Zionist work in Palestine since the pre-war days, and long since imbued with a kind of third temple sacrality in Zionist discourse and iconography. And we can see this in the next slide. Um, this one, thank you. Um, this slide shows us the Betzalel Art Academy and Art uh, and Museum. Right? And I don't know if you can make it out clearly enough on your screen, but those of you who know this building today called Bet HaOman, still standing in uh, downtown Jerusalem, on its rooftop is a seven-branched menorah, uh, symbolizing, in fact, or reflecting Boris Schatz's notion that, in fact, in establishing Bitzalel, the center of Hebrew art, he was effectively establishing uh, a new temple. And he tells us this explicitly. And so these kinds of uh, these kinds of institutions were long seen in this kind of light. Now, with spoils of war now available, the educators were offered the opportunity to, quote, install their schools in the fine ed edifices previously occupied by the Germans' Hilfsverein. Uh, this was a German-Jewish uh, philanthropy that did a great deal of educational work in Palestine, uh, and from which they had been expelled, the educators had been expelled the year before the war. The latter point, a reference to the tumultuous events of what had been known as the Language War of 1913-1914, which was itself 
a victorious reconsecration as it had been presented. Given the defilement that was now associated with that German Jewish philanthropy since those earlier events, however, the Hebrew teachers rejected the British offer of going into those buildings. We prefer, they replied, to remain in our own insignificant buildings. We would rather not teach morals within those impure walls. A renewed Hebrew education must not be polluted even by the physical structures still apparently secreting German mire. It would take the prodding of Chaim Weizmann, newly prominent now under the impact of his success in leading the drive toward the Balfour Declaration, to reverse the educator's rejection. Even the temple, he reminded them, after being profaned, was consecrated anew. And we shall do the same with the desecrated school buildings. Further reflecting this sense of the historic or perhaps meta-historic significance of the events, Chemda's husband, the more famous Eliezer ben Yehuda, now changed the dating system he employed for his newspapers and in his private correspondence. Calendars had been an interest of ben Yehuda since much earlier and had long represented to him the twin poles of exile and redemption. Neither the Gregorian nor the traditional Hebrew calendar had adorned Hashkafa, Hatzvi, or Ha'ol, the newspapers he published in the pre-war years, but rather a computation that began from the destruction of the Second Temple. Now, in the wake of Balfour, Ben Yehuda determined that time itself had begun anew and would have to be measured differently, with 1917 now marked as the year one. But the British Zionist relationship, as we know, was not always the smoothest of marriages, and initial cracks would become apparent not long after the brief post-Balfour honeymoon. Elie Podet has argued that what seemed often to be a lackluster reality under British mandatory rule led to a downplaying of what were now Balfour Day, Redemption Day, and Redemption Week, and to a marked restraint in its commemoration in the Yishuv. And we can see these uh, in the next two slides. Um, this, is, uh, no, this is a slide a a advertising, you have a poster there, uh, calling people to prepare for the great celebration of this new holiday marked on November 2nd, the day of the Balfour Declaration. And in the photograph, we can see crowds gathered there. And then the next slide. Um, in this slide, once again, we see um, a, uh, a popular gathering for the 2nd of November and an ad from the fairly new newspaper Haaretz uh, with a special issue for what is now the Redemption Week, not only Redemption Day on November 2nd, but Redemption Week. So these, these motifs were translated into tangible uh, cultural uh, realities in, uh, in the Jewish issue in Palestine. Indeed, as early as November 1919, Hapoel Atzair remarked, and Hapoel Atzair was another important journal, remarked that the Declaration's second anniversary was marked by Palestine's Jews, quote, noiselessly and without commotion. The mood, according to the report, was not appropriate for large-scale celebrations, given the dissonance between the harsh realities and the lofty hopes for the future. But as even these laments indicate, the disappointments themselves serve to indicate the sweeping expectations upon which they were based. Chaim Weizmann made this duality explicit in comments of his own, made shortly after that second anniversary of the declaration in 1919. In an interview with the recently established Haaretz newspaper, the Zionist leader explained that, quote, we knew from the outset that the period between the declaration of our rights and our acquisition of them would be the most difficult in Zionist history, in which all of our wisdom and all of our strength would be put to the test in the pangs of redemption. The Balfour Declaration, he continued, is within us. It was, to me, the great blowing of the shofar that should have awoken the nation's masses and created within them a kind of messianic movement. This, he lamented, had not fully come about, but Balfour nevertheless remained that messianic trumpet that should serve as the basis for such an awakening. By the time the 10th anniversary of the Declaration came about, the ambivalent realities of the British Zionist marriage, the sense of Zionist lethargy, and an era of global political reaction 
all fused to make the day a melancholy one, and I quote, for labor Zionist leader Beru Katzenelson. Yet melancholy though Katznelson and others may have felt in 1927, Jerusalem was nevertheless home to a significant celebration of the anniversary that year. In his address to the celebrants, the historian, writer, and activist Josef Klausner acknowledged that in this difficult hour at home and abroad, it is impossible to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration in a manner befitting it. Nevertheless, he insisted, the 2nd of November is the occasion for great celebration. Klausner then made a teleological argument in which the Balfour Declaration was not merely a product of recent events, but had rather been predetermined by the long durée course of history. Behind Zionism, he wrote, stood a millennia-old force, the force of Jewish destiny inscribed in the Book of Books. It was practical work in Palestine, fused with ideal destiny, that brought the Balfour Declaration into the world. For this reason, he suggested, there was no need to fear that it be abrogated. There is no power in the world, he concluded, that can annul the destiny of thousands of years. In the face of disappointments, Klausner said, one can lean upon the prophet Jeremiah's admonitions regarding the long trajectory of divine history. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord in Jeremiah's words, and not a God far away? One must see not just what can be seen up close, Klausner concludes, but that which must come about in the fullness of time. In another evaluation of the preceding decade, this time from a more traditional religious perspective, albeit a unique one, Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak Kohen Kuk, who had been named the first chief Ashkenazi rabbi by the British authorities a few years earlier, also took a stance on Balfour's place in the grand scheme of Jewish redemptive history. At a time when we are marching closer and closer to our anticipated redemption, he wrote, the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the declaration was a time to look back and evaluate, quote, all of the steps we have taken along the wondrous path of Israel's deliverance, on the road to the rising redemption of Israel that is bounded up with our return, the return of the children to their own country, Shivat Banim Ligvulam. Book two acknowledged that the practical results of the declaration are not always heartening, and that much of this had to do with our own neglect of the work of construction and rebirth which is the only means through which Israel will be redeemed. And yet he assured his readers that the declaration had grown out of divine roots and that the historic march toward redemption, once begun, could not be turned back. The Balfour Declaration, he wrote, was by now inscribed forever on the stone tablets of history and cannot be expunged. It was now up to the Jews in Palestine to continue the sacred work, in his words, of bodily and spiritual awakening to return the children both to their earthly and heavenly terrain. Now, you might say it's a little too easy to quote Rav Kook in this context. After all, Kook was a mystical religious Zionist, and in this sense, he's in a different category from the quote-unquote secular Zionists I've cited so far. Now, this, in fact, leads me to a central point that I'd like to stress. Writings on the Balfour Declaration have placed it and its history in multiple contexts. Zionist policymaking in general, Zionist wartime diplomacy, the geopolitics of the emerging Middle East, or the Eastern Question, as it was called, the history of the British Empire and British imperial policy. Some scholars have debated the extent to which Balfour himself and his motivations ought to be understood as being rooted in his religious background under the impact of the restorationist theologies that were popular in certain currents in the Anglican Church in the 19th century. But only a single article that I've found places the Jewish reception of Balfour in a religious theological context. This seems to me to be a significant lacuna. Zionism operated in multiple contexts, of course, but we tend sometimes to forget that the world of Jewish religious discourse was very much one of them. More than backdrop, it was the discursive, semiotic, exegetical language through which much of Zionist thought, and perhaps even policymaking, were still being articulated in this period. And as Yitzhak Krauss has shown, the conversation in response to Balfour as it took place in the broader Jewish world, well beyond the confines of Zionism, 
touched consistently and intensely on questions of messianism and redemption. The core question that seems to have animated the Orthodox Jewish world after November 1917 was whether Balfour's act should be seen as a piece of divine providence or not. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, for example, was adamant in his refusal to see Balfour or any human-led diplomatic activity as an indication of divine acquiescence in the Zionist idea. Referring back to the famous three oaths that were taken in much of the Orthodox world to be indicators of Zionism's invalidity, he explained that even the redemption by Moses and Aaron had been an incomplete one, precisely because of its human-led dimension. The next redemption would be complete, and as such would necessarily come about through the direct hand of God alone, with no human participation. Balfour and Zionism as a whole could clearly then not be a part of it, and in fact constituted an obstacle to it. The Munkacher Rebbe, one of the most important Eastern European Hasidic leaders, took this a step further, rendering Balfour's name in a play on words uh, in Hebrew as Baal Peor, the biblical idol whose name became symbolic with Balaam's attempt to curse Israel, and by extension with the demonic or the satanic. The Balfour Declaration, like Zionism itself, according to his reading, were but a temptation set out by the forces of evil, and any Zionist successes, including Balfour, are the result of the demonic forces with which it is associated. It is, in other words, the very opposite of, and in opposition to, divine providence, a force attempting to obstruct true redemption through the seductive force of its false counterpart. Within Agudat Israel, opinions were divided, although overall it appears that, Balfour, that the Balfour Declaration constituted a critical turning point in that party's attitude to Zionism. What is in any case clear is that the division among its thinkers and speakers revolved around this very same question of Balfour's relationship to divine providence and redemption. This was the world, or one of the worlds at least, in which Zionism and certainly many Zionists operated. And these were not just ideas and theological speculation. They were given concrete form in a range of religious ritual practices, whether the decision by Warsaw rabbis that Balfour Day should be an occasion for the recitation of Hallel, a prayer associated with deliverance from slavery to freedom, the battle against that decision waged by some Agudat Yisrael rabbis, or the special version of the Kaddish recited in some Jerusalem synagogues upon the appointment of Herbert Samuel as first high commissioner, which placed him now at the center of the processes of redemption. And that special Kaddish included the words, Bechayechon uveyomechon uvechaye Eliezer ben Menachem. Eliezer ben Menachem was the Hebrew name of Herbert Samuel. So what does this tell us about Zionism? Was Zionism then a messianic movement? One thing it seems we can undoubtedly say about, uh, about it is that even in its more secular versions, it was in constant dialogue with Jewish messianic traditions and constituted another intervention in a centuries old conversation about messianism and the meaning and, char and character of the messianic age. Where this conversation turned and what it might mean could differ widely from one current of Zionist thought to another and sometimes with tensions evident within a given current or thinker. This tension, it seems, is a fundamental characteristic of Zionism, and one that is often not looked at with sufficient attention and care. I'm not sure I would argue that Balfour is in this sense a critical watershed, but it is, I think, an important signpost or a lighthouse directing its beam toward what is surely a core and defining tension within Zionism one which remains a critical and perilous strain in the fabric of Israeli society today, where differing and often diametrically opposed understandings of redemption continue to shape central aspects of political debate and social and cultural tension. Now, I want to turn now to another aspect of this dialogue with redemption in order to suggest what I think secular Zionism tended most often to do with this tension-filled dialogue. So I'll turn now uh, to Zionist historiographies of Zionism, Zionist writings of the Zionist past, in other words, uh, to some of the ways in which Zionism told its own story. Okay, So I'll begin with a piece 
of cultural criticism, in fact, that appeared in late 1910 in the Labor Zionist journal Ha'achdut. And we can move to the next slide. In this piece, Yaakov Zubavil, one of the journal's editors and a leader of the fledging Marxist Zionist movement Po'alei Tzion, Ha'achdut was their paper, uh, addressed two works of art that had appeared around the same time in the Yishu. He used these two works as an opportunity to consider the ways in which they reflected exile and redemption as the two key themes that had informed all of Jewish history and that had led, as he understood it, to the Zionist project in Palestine. Uh, you can see uh, for the Hebrew readers out there, uh, the title of this piece in which he uh, writes, the, writes this cultural uh, criticism is Galut Ugeula. Exile and Redemption. So these are the key themes and the, the key axes for him upon which or around which Jewish history revolves. In his piece, Zobavel considered David Pinsky's or David Pinsky's play, The Eternal Jew, published in 1906, with the first effort at an amateur production in Jerusalem performed in 1910. And this is what he's referring to. And also to Shmuel Hershenberg's painting by the same name which had recently been donated by the artist to the Bitzal El Art Museum, where it became an iconic image. We can move to the next slide. Okay, this is the Hirschenberg painting, a striking painting. Um, this became almost a site of pilgrimage. All sorts of uh, Zionist figures who came to visit the Bitzal El uh, Art School before the First World War would pose and have their picture taken in front of this painting. Um, next slide. Okay, and this is uh, Pinsky and a uh, poster advertising that late 1910 amateur performance of Hayyehudi Anitzchi, right, the Eternal Jew. Uh, as you can see there, Chovevei uh, Habama Hayvrit, the lovers of the Hebrew stage, early attempts to create Hebrew theater. And next slide. And with this slide, I'm cheating a little bit. I don't have any photographs from the 1910 production. This is from a 1920s production uh, of the play, but it can give us some idea. Okay. Now, the two works shared title served Zubavel as the impetus for his reflections on the question of what it was that was central in Jewish life and culture. In his commentary, he recalls the classical Jewish trope which holds that on the day the temple was destroyed, the Redeemer was born. This to him was but a late articulation of the fact that the two experiential and theological poles of exile and redemption were, quote, stitched into the nation's soul over the millennia of its existence as its two primordial sentiments. Notwithstanding his criticism of what he saw as traditional Jewish messianic passivity, he argued that it was the messianic idea that had provided the persecuted nation with a vision of the future, a longing of the spirit for which the nation yearned all its days. Indeed, he wrote, the Hebrew nation cannot live without the messianic idea, without a belief in redemption. And it's worth bearing in mind here, this again, he is Poilet uh, Zion, uh, a Marxist Zionist uh, uh, group. Uh, the language of Zubavel in this text is, does not sound particularly Marxist. Um, and we'll move to another figure. This is Aaron David Gordon, known as Ade Gordon. And we can see him in the next slide. Um, he was another figure, uh, an iconic figure of early labor Zionism, who made use of a rereading of the past to send a message about the future uh, that was distinctly non-Marxist, but also labor Zionist. Gordon, too, turned to historical analogy to explicate the ways in which he understood the Zionist project in Palestine, its own redemptive meanings, and the diversity of redemptions from which it might draw. Immediately upon their return to Jerusalem, Gordon wrote, our forefathers, the returnees from the Babylonian exile, had established there the center of the entire movement of their rebirth and redemption by building the temple, which became a powerful draw for the hearts of all those in exile. To Gordon, in other words, the Zionist undertaking in Palestine was analogous to the return to the land of Israel after the destruction of the first temple and the exile to Babylonia. 
Its model, moreover, is that of the construction of a second temple and the renewal of Jewish life and law on the land. It is, in other words, a redemptive historical moment. To be sure, Rodon did consider the differences between these two redemptive moments to be of significance. Unlike the returnees from Babylonia, he wrote, we do not have such a magnet as the temple. This, however, should not be, such a, should not be a source of despair, since in fact his own generation, the generation of rebirth, as he called it, are more similar to those who departed Egypt, whose creative forces were fresher, greater, and more original. The two historical parallels that Golden suggests for the Zionist project, then, are the two foundational and formative Jewish experiences of transition from exile and servitude to freedom, homeland, and a renewed covenant. In this sense, the young generation for whom Golden wrote stood on the cusp of a redemption far grander than that of the returnees from Babylon. Before us, he argued, stands a new world, a life the likes of which has never before existed. And it is, it is within that prospect that a new life and a new redemption must be created for the nation and for the individual alike, who are recovery of the authentic individual and national self. Redemption, he declared, must come from within, from the rediscovery and recreation of an authentic individual and national self, both connected to their source and core. This is our task, he declared. We must plant the redemptive ideal of rebirth in its natural soil to awaken here a new life, our life, and to place the center of our movement within life itself. The Messiah's trumpet has not yet been sounded, he concluded. It will not be sounded other than from within the new life that, we, that will be created here. Now, I was going to talk a little bit about another figure named Yosef Witkin, um, but I see that time is pressing, and so uh, we can see the, the image of Witkin in the next slide. Um, and Witkin also um, tells the history of Zionism at a very early stage in Zionism's own history, uh, with, with a powerfully redemptive lens, uh, but you'll have to take my word for that at the moment. We can come back to Vitkin in the Q&A if people are curious. And I want to skip ahead to Nahum Sokolov's redemptive history of Zionism. Thank you. Um, and this is really the most ambitious, thorough, and in some senses also very idiosyncratic effort to narrate the story of Zionism on a grand scale uh, that appeared in 1919. Uh, undertaking to tell a long durée history of Zionism with broad cultural, social, and political perspectives, Nahum Sokolov's history of Zionism would attribute to the movement and to him the clearly redemptive idea a surprising starting point. Now, it's important to recall the dramatic changes in context between the time when Gordon and Witkin were writing before the war and the time when Sokolov's book appeared, which is on the heels of the war. If, for the former authors, a redemptive message had to be drawn out of a deep well of despair, Sokolov was now writing in an atmosphere in which many Zionists, as we've seen, had a sense that the footsteps of a redemptive messianic age could already be heard approaching. It's this new reality that serves as the backdrop to the twin frames in which Sokolov places his understanding of Zionist history. Zionism, he seems to suggest, must be understood as the product of a redemptive teleology combined in some surprising ways with the political and religious history of England since the beginning of the 17th century and dating back to the shared connection that the Jews and the English have to the Bible. By opening his history with the biblical moment, rooting the Zionist idea in the biblical text, Sokolov, in fact, casts a tale that will come to fruition many pages and centuries later with the fulfillment of Zionism as a three-pronged completion of the, Jew of the Jewish mission and destiny, of English morality and culture, and of Western and human civilization as a whole. The mission of the Hebrew race, he writes, was to lay the foundation of morality and religion on earth. In Sokolov's vision, England's adoption of the biblical text and of Israel itself, another key theme repeated throughout the text, coupled with its expansion as the world's greatest empire, have given it a place of honor as a leading instrument in this civilizing mission to bring morality and justice to the world. 
British support of Zionism and the promulgation of the Balfour Declaration as its most recent and substantial manifestation were a central aspect of this, as Zionism itself in Sokolov's presentation is one piece in a broader human redemptive drama that was finally coming to fruition on the tale of the traumatic and destructive war, itself a form of Hevlei Mashiach, the tribulations that are traditionally expected to precede the Messiah's arrival. Writing in the heady post-Balfour days, the honeymoon moment in the relations between Zionism, Zionism and Britain, Sokolov posits the Jewish return to England in the 17th century, right, the Jews had been expelled in the 13th, as the launching point for modern Zionism. Indeed, he argues it was a fundamentally Zionist impulse that lay at the base of the demand for a Jewish return to England in the first place, as conceived both by Jews and Christians in the mid-17th century. Much of his focus in this context is devoted to the 17th century figure Menashe ben Israel, whom he describes as, quote, the chief promoter of the readmission of the Jews to England and the leading figure in the history of that great event. In addition to his political activity and acumen, Sokolov adds that Menashe was nothing if not a Zionist. Now, how does Sokolov, uh, I, I won't uh, elaborate on uh, all of Sokolov's redemptive vision in the book, uh, but I want to come to what he calls the theocracy that he envisions. And I want to notice it's a very unique understanding of theocracy. Uh, Sokolov argues that Zionism is direct heir to the biblical promise and to Jewish messianic expectations. And he goes to the constitution established by Moses, which, as he writes, was a theocracy. What does he mean by this? Okay. Uh, he writes the following. The true king of Israel was God, and the constitution was the law, the law, the, Hebrew, the, the religious law. The kingdom was thus emphatically the kingdom of God, and the king was but the earthly viceroy of the, of the invisible sovereign. The Jewish nation regards this, this kingdom of God, as an ideal state and looks forward to a future in which, in which this idea will be accepted by the whole world when God will be the king. But this will take place only after the establishment of this divine order in Palestine. Zionism, then, is not only the fulfillment of millennia-old biblical promises, as Sokolov would have it, but points toward a full return from physical and spiritual exile for Jews and non-Jews alike. It would be wrong, however, to read Sokolov as aiming at a theocratic regime in the sense that his words would likely evoke to our ears. His vision of Zionist redemption, although rooted in this biblical theological approach, is nevertheless more multifaceted and arguably owes more to the liberal Judaism with which he is at loggerheads than he might have cared to admit. He calls for a kind of kingdom of God that recalls Martin Buber's uh, kind of theological anarchism in which God alone can be sovereign. I want to conclude. On May 14th, 1948, the Zionist effort to proclaim a state, of course, came to fruition. But for key Zionist leaders, this was hardly an end point. Five years after the establishment of the State of Israel, its future president, Zalman Shazar, wondered, will we have the spiritual strength and flexibility to renew Zionist thought in our day? And that Zionist thought, he argued, needs to be renewed in, quote, the light of the generation's vision of national redemption. A similar sentiment was, expe was expressed by David Ben-Gurion. We can go to the final slide. The man who stood at the center of the establishment of the state, the most political of political Zionists in this sense, repeatedly sought to remind his public, particularly after the creation of the state, that statehood was not, in fact, the final goal, but rather a means to a far greater purpose. The destiny placed on the shoulders of Israel constituted a profound and historic test for the nation, he explained, primarily because the heritage of the prophets of Israel and our unique place in the world obligate us. The state of Israel, he concluded from this, will be tested based on its will and ability 
to fulfill the vision of Jewish and human redemption envisaged by our prophets on the hills of Judea. Will Israel, he asked, be able to live up to this supreme test? Now, writing a few years later in the 1960s, Israeli political philosopher Yaakov Talmon cautioned against the dangers of what he called political messianism. Talmon was writing only two decades after the end of the Second World War and in a context in which the Soviet Union was still a very live and threatening reality. His warning was surely correct and important. But Talmon could not have envisioned the early 21st century, nor could he have known that a politics of quote, post-truth and nihilistic opportunism devoid of values and of any redemptive vision constitute a danger that is no less considerable. In our time, a time in which such terms as redemption, messianism, and even Zionism have become in some circles terms of scorn and derision that can only be used cynically. And in other circles, they have become political and theological justifications for xenophobia and intolerance. It seems we would do well to recall how many of the founders of Zionism understood the true essence and purpose of the idea that they lived and sought to advance and the meanings and purpose of the state they helped to establish. Many different Zionists articulating multiple versions of Zionism formulated numerous visions of individual, national, universal human redemption. From the standpoint of the early 21st century, and particularly in the dramatic historical moment in which Israel and the world find themselves today, it appears to me that the greatest challenge faced by Zionism today if it is to have any worthy meaning, is to transcend those detractors and would-be supporters and leaders alike who would make of Zionism little more than a xenophobic, exclusionary, militant chauvinism and rediscover within itself the humanistic, liberationist movement and idea that it sought to be in so many of its historical manifestations and articulation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Professor Sapoznik, for such a, a complex and layered history of um, redemption and exile. And it was very fascinating. Um, for those of you with questions, please uh, go ahead and enter them in the Q&A now. Um, and we'll take this time now to uh, discuss some of the questions here. Um, to get us started, um, is, is, do you find this kind of redemptive language to be really um, redemptive language, or is it more of a, a mobilizing rhetoric for, for people? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's an important question. There, there are historians uh, who would differ with me, uh, and it's important to know they're very good historians who differ with me on this, who argue that, in fact, this kind of uh, messianic or redemptive language was not meant, did not in fact have a messianic or a redemptive content and was really sort of a useful mobilizing uh, um, tool. Um, I, I, I disagree with that, as you might have gathered. Um, I think the, the kind of uh, redemptive language and the kind of redemptive uh, uh, intensity that we find in so much of Zionist writing simply seems to me to suggest that it was quite uh, seriously meant. And, and we find this all over the place, really a, a notion that there's something had gone wrong in history, that Zionism was about setting it right. And this had implications, again, for at least four levels of redemption, the individual, the national, the human, and in some versions of Zionism, such as in the Zionism of Ade Gordon, even a kind of cosmic redemption where he draws on the Jewish mystical tradition of uh, the notion that, that even the universe itself is in a kind of exile uh, and will be set aright by Zionism. Great. Thank you. Um, I see another a question here actually from, from Art Hessel, who was one of our panelists. Um, do any political leaders in Israel today treat redemption as an important part of Zionism as opposed to a political part? Yeah, so that's a good question. And in fact, uh, um, it's an opportunity for me to clarify something I, I perhaps should have clarified in the talk itself. And that is uh, an important distinction in my view between redemptive uh, motifs and messianic motifs. Okay. Uh, so um, I mentioned Yaakov Talmon who cautions against political messianism and he cautions against it because political messianism 
uh, believes that uh, in order to bring about the end of days, the messianic end, um, uh, you know, we, it needs to be brought about essentially immediately, and essentially all means are legitimate for that. Um, the redemptive visions that I'm talking about, and we see this very clearly uh, in the thinking and writing of somebody like Ben Gurion, right, who tells us he has this grand redemptive vision, and I gave you some taste of it. But on the other hand, he says, there's a wonderful quote where he says, you know, the Messiah doesn't appear in the phone book, right? If we remember what phone books are, um, uh, we can't, uh, in other words, it's an aim, it's a goal we should strive for, but we recognize that human realities are imperfect and we don't try to impose a perfect reality on the imperfect human reality. So, so we aim at this kind of moral uh, universalist perfection but recognizing that uh, we need to be very, very cautious in uh, trying to implement it. Thank you. Um, a number of other questions have come in. Um, a, a couple about like a contemporary um, society. So one here, can you touch on how the redemptive language is relevant, um, part of contemporary Israeli discourse? Yeah, so, um, and in fact, I would say the following. First of all, we, we have strong currents of um, messianism in, in major, uh, in the leading uh, current of religious Zionism today. Um, what we lack, and in fact, you know, if I have a, if I can take off my historian hat and put on my Israeli citizen hat for a moment, I think what we lack and desperately need is a return to a kind of redemptive vision. I think in, in in uh, what we roughly call the secular Israel, right, which includes people who aren't strictly speaking secular, uh, uh, includes what we call traditionalists in Israel. It's a wide swath of, of Israeli society. I think we need to recapture this sense of, uh, of a purpose, of a grand purpose, which did animate much of Zionism, and I think Israeli society in its early years, um, and I think today, uh, in too much of Israeli society, is almost embarrassing to talk about. Um, so I think it has too little place in Israeli cultural discourse today. Uh, again, with having been replaced by a kind of political messianism um, that, uh, again, putting on my own ideological hat, personally, I think is dangerous. Yes, yeah, thank you. Looking here now, the how, how did the early Zionists address the issue that the land they sought to return to, that is Palestine, was owned and populated by um, other people? Yeah, well, that's a very important question, of course. Um, I would say I get two two answers to that. First of all, I think in the in the scheme of redemption. Certainly, where uh, it was uh, had the universalist dimension, there was a certain assumption that uh, this included all people, and it, it was obvious. It was it was almost obvious to many early Zionists that Zionism would only bring about benefit, including to the Arabs of Palestine. Right? Um, and you know, it really requires, of course, an entirely uh, an additional talk. To talk about the origins of the Israeli or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, really it's not an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, then it's a Jewish-Arab conflict. But I'll say this: uh, I, I sort of mentioned it very, very briefly in passing. We have two kinds of approaches, uh, roughly speaking, right? There, in the ways in which Zionists approached the question of the Arabs living in Palestine, one was. Um, represented by the famous quote by Theodor Herzl, right, where he writes the German Kaiser, uh, Zionism will create a bulwark against Asiatic barbarism, right? In other words, the notion that Zionism is taking Europe and European civilization and will really act as a tool of European civilization as an outpost in this barbaric Asiatic environment. But that's one current. Uh, there was another current which I argue was at least as prominent, at least until 1929. Okay? And that was the notion that held that, in fact, 
Jews were not Europeans. And part of their redemption, it's important to remember, by the way, that one of the terms that became popular uh, in referring to Jews uh, in Europe in the 19th century and into the 20th was the quote unquote half Asian, right? The notion that Jews were not really Europeans, or at least not fully so. They, they really belonged in Asia. Uh, and much of Zionism accepted this notion and said, you know what, right? We're basically uh, not really Europeans. We need to strip away the outer casing of European civilization that Jews in Europe had taken on over the centuries and re-merge with, in the language of the time, our racial brethren, right? Um, and to, you know, to quote one source, for example, the notion that, quote, our rebirth must be a part of the rebirth of the nations of the East, right? And so you find this tension between what we might call a westernizing desire within Zionism and an easternizing desire within Zionism, both of them, I would argue, um, tied up with notions of redemption because a, a leading sentiment that, that was an impetus for Zionism was the notion of what was called the fissure in the heart, right? The notion that, that modern Jews were inevitably sort of ripped in two and in seeking to sort of reunite those two halves, they would either become fully Western, as the one current held, or once again become part of the Orient. Now, um, of course, there were all sorts of romantic imagery involved in both of those currents, but we also have to bear in mind that one of the things, I say this was a dominant current at least until 1929, because the 1929 riots uh, drove home to many Zionists in Palestine, that in fact, that East with which they were so uh, ardently seeking to merge once again, was not so eager to have them merge with it. Um, and this was part of uh, a more Western turn, I think. Although to this day in Israeli culture, we can find this blend of, of Western orientation and Eastern orientation uh, and the tensions that come with that. Great, great. Thank you. Um, I want to go go back to maybe the, the, the question I asked before this. It seems like there's a couple of follow-up pieces to it. Um, one is, um, is redemptive thought uh, any part of modern Aliyah? And um, do any political leaders in Israel today treat redemption as an important part of Zionism as opposed to a political part? It's a great question. I'm not sure I know how to answer it fully. Um, uh, I think one would need to do sort of sociological, anthropological research on Olim, contemporary Olim, to know better what motivates them. Uh, certainly, if we're talking about Aliyah from North America, uh, most North American Olim in recent years tend to be Orthodox. Uh, and I would argue then that there's a good chance that they are motivated by the kind of messianic sentiment that tends to dominate much of religious Zionism today. Um, I think, and this is conjecture, uh, so, uh, but, I, but I would suggest that the, the non-Orthodox Olim who do come probably, uh, in so, at least on some level, have a sense uh, that Aliyah uh, involves returning to a more authentic self, um, we, uh, coming to some something that is um, fuller, in a sense, the, the notion of fulfillment. Uh, and so at least on some level, my guess is uh, that there's a, some, at, uh, at least individual, redemptive dimension. Uh, how much it extends beyond, I, I, I really don't know. Great, thank you. And um, sort of the another piece to that, to that question, um, do, to, do political leaders in Israel today treat redemption as uh, an important part of Zionism as opposed to a, a political part? So um, I'm not 100% sure I understand what the as opposed to a political part means, uh, but I would say again, um, I think certainly when we're talking about the leaders of religious Zionism today, right, who are an important part of the current coalition, they speak very strongly in the language of political messianism. Right. 
Um, the kind of redemptive vision that I'm talking about is, is to a large extent in opposition to that political messianism. Um, I think that it is, uh, uh, it's, it's there among some leaders, but I think it's not there sufficiently, quite frankly. Um, I think uh, some greater vision of what we're here for uh, would be beneficial to the kind of cultural discourse uh, that we have in Israel today. Thank you. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's another question here. Um, I guess, as you said, is even more the messianic vision. And but um, somebody wants to, to hear more about the the students of Svi Yehuda Cook that has um, been driven more by redemptive messianic vision and is much more right right wing extreme. Um, yeah. And if you want to say more about that or evaluate that, yeah. Uh, okay. So I mean, I, you know, I, I can't not be political in answering this. Um, yes, uh, the Tzvi Yudakuk um, is really the, who's the son of um, uh, the Kuk that I spoke of, of Raham, um, is the spiritual leader of what would become the Gush Emuni movement, uh, the Settler movement. Um, and yes, in my understanding, certainly, this is a political messianism, uh, which places uh, redemption of the land, which of course was another dimension of Zionist redemption, right? Zionism, uh, uh, in fact, also had a notion, and there's a traditional Jewish notion that when the children of Israel uh, were exiled from the land, the Shekhinah, the divine presence was exiled from the land as well, right? And so there's a, a theological dimension to the notion of exile and return, um, which secular Zionism picks up on as well. Certainly this kind of religious uh, messianic Zionism picks up on very acutely. Uh, what has happened uh, since 1967 is that uh, the redemption of, of the holy sites uh, in, um, uh, in the territories conquered in 1967 have become sort of uh, an almost exclusive messianic uh, fo focus of, uh, of religious Zionism, and I think at the expense of the kind of humanistic vision that we hear in the redemptive vision uh, of these early Zionist founders. And in fact, that's exactly the reason why I think the non-Orthodox uh, Israeli discourse needs to rediscover the humanistic redemptive vision uh, in order um, to have a more convincing vision to counterpose to that messianism. Great, um, great, thank you. Yes, uh, yeah. And there's a, there's a couple more questions here. Um, the the history of the the Yishu response to Balfour and Allenby reinforces the Palestinian view that Zionism is nothing more than an arm of Western imperialism. It's a view that is gaining support in academia and on and on campuses. What in our history is response to that? Yeah, well, I think there are a few things. Um, indeed, I think whoever wrote that question is absolutely correct. Uh, this is, in fact, the dominant discourse in the academic world is one which sees Zionism as essentially a kind of uh, Western colonialism. It ignores a wide range of issues, as one of my colleagues wrote. First of all, it ignores Europe. It ignores the reality in which European Jews, and it's very easy to forget today, by the way, you know, that Zionism so dramatically revolutionized Jewish life that it's easy to forget what it meant, what it was like to be a Jew in the early 20th century. Okay? It was not fun. Um, Jews in Europe, as, as some people who have not forgotten Europe have written, um, were essentially an internally colonized people. Okay? And many of the kinds of um, images and tropes that we find uh, in what Edward Said uh, refers to in, in, in his book on Orientalism, in much of the literature on colonials, and the ways in which colonizing powers uh, looked at and treated the colonized is, has many, many parallels uh, in the reality of Jewish life in Europe um, uh, in the early 20th century. We need to remember there was no metropole that sent the Jews to Palestine, right? The Jews were not coming 
uh, to extract the resources of Palestine and send them back to the mother country. Right? In that sense, Zionism is certainly not akin to classical uh, colonialism. Uh, some have argued that it is then a form of settler colonialism. Um, I can tell you, I've just written an article in which I argue that uh, right, in order to make the case that Zionism is a form of settler colonialism, we still need to see Zionists as these foreign invaders and the Palestinian Arabs as the distinct natives of the land. It's very interesting uh, to see that in the 1920s, uh, there was a group of people known as a Solel, led by a guy by the name of Itamar Ben-Avi. I've had occasion, uh, had occasion during the talk to refer to the Ben-Yehuda family. When I spoke about Eliezer and Chemda Ben-Yehuda. This is uh, Eliezer's son, Itamar Ben-Avi, uh, who led a group which essentially argued for Jewish indigeneity in Palestine. And this was a widespread Zionist notion. Um, I'll give you another example. In 1966, when the uh, Hebrew author Shai Agnon won the Nobel Prize for Literature, uh, in his Nobel speech, he says, and don't hold me to an exact quote here, uh, he says something like, uh, by an accident of history, by a tragedy in which Titus destroyed Jerusalem, I was born in one of the cities of exile. But always I saw myself as one who had been born in Jerusalem. Right? In other words, Jews had always seen themselves and had been seen by the people among whom they lived, whether they were living in the Christian world or the Muslim world, as really belonging over there, that over there being in Palestine, land of Israel. And so at least in Jewish self-perception, they uh, were coming home. They were not coming to um, invade a foreign land uh, uh, or uh, to use its resources. I would also add, by the way, they were not coming to displace another people. Uh, up until 1948, every piece of land uh, on which Zionists settled was purchased. Uh, it was not, uh, uh, you know, forcibly seized. Uh, it was purchased. Um, and uh, now we can argue about all sorts of uh, whether they always uh, uh, treated those from who, you know, the, the peasants living on the land the way they should have. These are all legitimate critiques and arguments. Um, but alongside certain practices, which of course were adopted from the colonial world, uh, inevitably so, um, the distinctions are, I think, very, um, very clear. Uh, there's an important article by a historian by the name of Derek Penslar uh, titled Zionism, Colonialism, and Postcolonialism, where he does a good job of making sense of what are some of the practices that Zionism did adopt from colonial uh, um, practices, uh, and how, in many ways, Zionism, however, was anti-colonial in the state of Israel, a post-colonial uh, state. Um, so it's, it's a complicated picture. Uh, in my own reading, the bulk of the weight falls on a anti-colonial and post-colonial uh, uh, interpretation. But you know, we can argue about where, where the different weights uh, fall. Yes, yes, thank you. Um... Uh, I'll go ahead. We only have a couple of minutes left. There's a, there's a few other questions that I've seen come in, but I wanted to give you an opportunity. To, if you have any final words you want to say, um, you've, you've you know you've mentioned a couple of times about the you know aspects of the more humanistic view, um, a more convincing vision of redemption of redemption um, first for Israel society today, or, or, you know, Jewish society today, um, world society. Do you want to say anything more about that and um, and sort of leave us with your final words? I would really just say, you know, again, in, in my reading of Zionism, um, in fact, that humanistic redemptive vision was was dominant. Okay? But, you know, Zionism had many currents, and you know, it's almost hard to talk about Zionism in the singular. We really should speak about Zionisms in the plural. Um, but it's fair to say that in much of Zionism, much of the time. Uh, this was the kind of image that, uh, that, that and, and the kind of expectation that Zionists had, right? That it would bring about a, a meta-historical corrective, right? Something had gone wrong in history. And uh, this would be a meta-historical corrective that would be, 
a, uh, a a redemptive corrective for the Jewish individual, who, as I mentioned before, had been ripped apart with the encounter with modernity and would now be full once again, the Jewish nation, the Jewish land, and humanity as a whole. Um, in fact, I would add the, on a final note, I think without this, without this humanistic vision, Zionism could not have expected to have the kind of impact that it had, right? I mentioned in the talk what's known as the Basel platform, right? The Basel, the Basel program. The Basel program spoke of uh, the creation of a Jewish home publicly recognized and legally assured. Right? This indicates that Zionists expected that publicly recognized and legally assured would be possible. In fact, it should be expected. Now, how should it be expected? Because Zionism rested on the basic notion that the Jewish right to a life of freedom and dignity was based on the human right to a life of freedom and dignity. That's why people would accept it. There could be no other basis, right? If, the, if Zionists had thought that only Jews are deserving of this right, they probably would not have expected other people to accept it, right? The only basis for Zionism is the, under, is, is the fundamental humanistic notion uh, that this is a right uh, shared by all peoples. Uh, if we are to forego that right or to dismantle it, we're going to dismantle the underpinnings of Zionism itself. And so we need to remind ourselves of that humanistic underpinning of the, of the entire Zionist enterprise. Great, great. Thank you. And uh, I think that's, that's a wonderful point for us to end on. And I, I appreciate all, all that you brought, all the history, layered history and, and reflections. I know many of us will, will take these throughout the rest of our day and weeks and, and think about it all. So thank you. And uh, all of you out there who joined us, uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.